So let's start with the second session of today. Um, welcome to, to everyone. This session uh, is dedicated to earth observation uh, technologies for viticulture. So, okay. Uh, so the agenda of today uh, is uh, um, general overview about earth observation for uh, for agriculture and then i will introduce you the the main protagonist of this presentation that is vitigeos project is a project uh, aimed to uh, develop a, a platform for uh, wine growers um so we will see some of the services of the intelligent services of vitigeos uh, uh, that use earth observation then I will show you the, the platform in action, and then we will have a um, uh, plenary session uh, to, to discuss about some, some of the topics that we prepared. Um, I will ask you to raise your hand anytime, at any time to, to ask questions, and also for the online audience, uh, write your question on the, on the Zoom chat, and we will have uh, Andrea that uh, ping us with the, with the question. So the speaker of today uh, is myself, Federico Aldani, uh, an AI applied researcher at Lynx Foundation. Uh, I already introduced myself uh, before, so but for uh, uh, those that were not here, uh, Lynx Foundation is a private research center in in Turin. Uh, Tommaso, that is a colleague of mine um, in at Lynx Foundation. And then we will uh, we we have uh, three um, speakers online uh, that are Ernesto Bastidas, um, the project manager at Elif, a private company um, that focus focused on uh, the development of uh, um, platform for agriculture. Rosa Araujo, the project coordinator of Vitigeos. Uh, at Eurecat, a uh, research center in Catalonia, and Andrea Nicodemu um, from uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center that will act as online moderators. So uh, let's start now. I, I give immediately the, the floor to, to Ernesto uh, to, to speak about uh, his experience in earth observation in agricultural sector. Please, Ernesto. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Federico, for the introduction. Um, I am Ernesto Bastidas. I am the business lead agri uh, at ELIF. And before I start, I want to say something about uh, ELIF. Uh, ELIF is a Dutch remote sensing company that provides satellite-based data and services for agriculture, water management, and to assess climate risk. Uh, Federico, I cannot see the slides. Okay, can you go what? Yeah, thank you. So before going into the matter, I want to first highlight why earth observation is important for agriculture. And as you see, we have an increasing population. Uh, we expect that by 2050, we will reach uh, 25 million people, billion people, and that deserve like for a uh, 60 giga calories. And the only way to reach that level is to improve land productivity. That means kilograms of dry biomass produced per hectare and improves the water productivity, which is kilograms of biomass produced for cubic meter of water use. With that, next please. We, going back one, please. Yeah, with that, also we have the European uh, deal, which aims at basically to, it was approved in 2020. And I cannot, can you highlight, because I cannot see the slide just a second. Let me see, because I cannot visualize, just let me, at my end, just a second. I need to visualize this. 
Do you need something from from here? No, it's the thing is that it's it's not very visible. I don't know for the rest of the people watching this presentation online if they can see. Yes, I just wrote that. Yeah, we can see you in the big screen, but we cannot see the slides. Yes. So. But there was a second in which it was good. Then I don't know what you did or what other person did. But if you can. Now, now it's good. Now oh, it's perfect. Okay. Yeah. OK, perfect. So, so then we have also the European Green Deal, which, uh, thank you, Federico, which was approved in 2020. And it's basically a, a set of, was approved to a policy in order to transform the European Union into a modern, resource efficient, and competitive economy, ensuring no net emissions of greenhouses by 50, uh, 2050 economic growth a couple from resource use and no person and no place left behind with this the european union wants to ensure food security in the face of climate change and biodiversity loss reduce the environmental and climate footprint of eu food systems and strengthen the eu food systems resilience and this in order to lead a global transition towards competitive sustainability from farm to fork. And this on top of that, please next. We have the sustainable development goals, which are familiar to many of us. And I have singled out where earth observations can play an important role. And these are in the second, third, six, 11, 13, 14, and 15 sustainable goals. So please next. So global challenges need global solutions. And that is why Earth observations can play an important role. You see here, for example, the dynamic of air temperature at two meters of ERA-5, where you can see how uh, the air, air temperature behaves throughout the throughout a growing cycle. And that is the kind of solutions that Earth observation can facilitate. Next, please. In the practice, one. Okay. Uh, one back, please. I think that's it. Oh, it's. Uh, I think it's a remote control uh, has some problem. Uh, can you can you please go back to yes. This. Yeah, that one. Okay. <laughs> So in that order of ideas, there have been many initiatives, for example, to monitor and stop deforestation. For example, this is a party that provides tree cover loss during the growing season of any country of any county in the world. Next, please. At ELIF, we are working towards reducing carbon emissions, for example, by a monitoring change in biomass production, land use change detection, the consumption or use of agricultural inputs like fertilizer, chemicals, or water, and working towards the decarbonization of the supply chain. This is, for example, one of our work there we assess the biomass production in two different moments in time, where you see the loss and improvement of biomass production in the Nile Delta of different production systems. Next, please. But in order to facilitate this process, Earth observation can use raw data, but also can make can combine different sources of data. And that is what we do at ELIF. We combine satellite data with meteorological data and static inputs like physical variables of crop model parameters in order to calculate quantitative information. For example, the kilograms of, bio of dry biomass produced every day or the millimeters of water evapotranspirated every day. With that information, next please, we have our two a flagship components, which is water consumption, which is the actual evapotranspiration in millimeters per day, and plant biomass production, kilograms per hectare.
per day. We have this at different scales of analysis from continental, national, regional, and, and field level. And I must say that uh, we will go global. Uh, after this slide, uh, we, uh, we will start providing global data for the FAO and on different variables. So it's available to anyone, but I'm going to introduce that in the next slide. So here we provide uh, different spatial resolutions. And with this information, we can do different types of analysis, which I'm going to introduce you shortly. Next, please. One back, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's the wrong. Can you go uh, no to the next? Okay. So, for example, we are probably honor and uh, we are honored to provide a data for the water productivity open access portal of the FEO, and here we provide free data accessible to anyone. These are 10 satellite-based data components at 250, 130 meter resolutions. And I, I update the slides in the weekend, but unfortunately it was not passed by because I got notified that we will go global. And that means that we will provide information for the entire world for this type of variables and are accessible to anyone. So please, this is going to be available. Uh, uh, the launch is going to be on the 4th of October and, and it will be available for everyone in the world. Next, please. When we look at the field information, now zooming in at in-field variability, we use, ELIF is using satellite data of satellite derived products we call, for example, the, our biomass, in order to estimate a estimate, um, better distribution of chemical applications. For example, usually chemical applications are defined by a rule of thumb. And with our data, we can provide a more localized uh, amount of doses per pixel of 10 by 10, 10 meters. Next, please. Also, we have been working uh, I mean, you have heard in the news uh, last year, the prices of nitrogen, especially urea. Uh, we have using also our data in order to optimize the use of fertilizer. So usually these 33 hectares will consume 359 kilograms per hectare of urea, but we have been able to use our biomass to strategically localize what are the amounts of urea that that particular field will need for the coming season? And this will work in two ways. Reduce first the price of the cost of fertilizer at field level, but also reduce the pressure of, a, of a greenhouse gases to be released into the atmosphere because less fertilizer is going to be used. Next, please. But Earth observation can be used also to generate communities. And this is how I call a community of fruit look in South Africa, where the Western Cape government has been, we have been providing data to the Western Cape government through the fruit look platform, where it combines different, first satellite data, value other partners, local value other partners that build on our data and help farmers in South Africa to save water, improve yield, and save money. Please, next. Currently, we are monitoring around 30 million hectares where we have more than 650 users, and this is the 12th season that we have been monitoring our, uh, those fields with our information. Some testimonials says, uh, remark that we have been, that end users have been able to reduce 10%, and 20%, so 19% of the users saw a reduction up to 20% of water that is being used for irrigation. On the other hand, some users have been, the yields increased by 30%. Next, please. So with this knowledge beforehand and this idea, we embark to work with different partners in, different, in order to build decision support tools for the wine industry of Europe. And this is what FITI is about. And my colleague is going to introduce you shortly. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you for your intervention. I think it's uh, um, it's good to 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 know uh, your experience, your life experience, uh, um, a real use case scenario in which you use earth observation. That, as you mentioned, um, a global pr problem require um, global solution, and earth observation is actually a global solution. Uh, can can drive to a global solution. Um, so thank you for uh, for your introduction. Uh, now uh, I leave the floor to to Rosa Rauco for a brief introduction of uh, the Vitigeos project. So go ahead, Rosa. Well, I think that first we have this nice video to show. No, at the very beginning. Okay, the... is it embedded into the presentation? I don't see. Can you? Show me the, okay. Uh, do we have the, um, the audio? Okay, if there is a problem, no problem, because this video is also uploaded. The European in Union is the largest wine producing region in the world with over 165 million hectoliters produced annually climate change provoking a higher frequency and intensity of extreme weather events threatens crops all around the world. On the other hand, more than 20% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide come from agricultural activities. This demonstrates why today, sustainable agriculture is more important than ever. The European-funded project Vidigios contributes to the increase of sustainability in the wine industry by offering a platform for optimizing day-to-day -day field management. Based on the integration of Earth observations, combining satellite data and sensors in the field, the Vidigios platform offers services providing advanced weather and sub-seasonal and seasonal climate forecasts, crop status indicators, phenological monitoring, disease warnings, crop water demand requirements, and a tool for managing business operations and sustainability assessment. Betty Gios aims to deliver a reliable decision support system to winemakers for smart vineyard management, supporting sustainable grapevine cultivation at an economic, environmental, and local level. The platform, being co-developed and tested in vineyards of three European wine producers, boosts vineyard sustainability and eases the industry adaptation to climate change. City Gios, striving for more sustainable vineyards and winemaking. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under Grant Agreement number 86 95 65. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to participate in this event. And I'm very sorry for not being able to be physically there. I'm Rosa Araujo, project manager at Eureka Technology Center in, in Spain, and the coordinator of this uh, very, very nice project. Um, here, uh, well, I cannot see the slide. I see them very small. Ah, uh, now, perfect, thank you. Here, uh, what motivated the project? As we've seen also in this in the video, as tangible data, we have that Europe is the biggest wine producer in the world. 60% of wine production comes from Europe, and agriculture is the major economic activity in the south of Europe. 20% of the total jobs in agriculture are related to wine, representing around 3 million jobs. As we know also, agriculture has a very important role in climate change being responsible for more than 20% of CO2 emissions. And on the other side, conventional agriculture is currently facing new challenges, for example, reducing dependence on pesticides, improving biodiversity, or adapting to climate change. If we want to help sustainable agriculture, not only new practices and tools are required to meet the needs of people, and take care of their health, but also additional solutions to contribute to reduce the negative effects of the climate change. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, what is VTGOS? VTGOS is a Horizon 2020 project, an innovation action funded under the call SC516-2019 for the development of commercial activities and services using GEOS and Copernicus data. Its duration was planned over 42 months. It started in September 2020 and it will finish in February 2024. This means that now we, are, we have four months left and during this last phase, we are validating the results with the third vegetative season. Next, please. Thank you. BTGEOS Consortium is composed of nine partners from four European countries and all members join the necessary expertise and operational capacity to implement all the project challenges. As technical partners, we are Eurecat, uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, ELIF, Links, and Universidad di Napoli, ensuring the high innovation capacity of our technologies. From the end user side uh, and validating the services in real settings and providing the data, we count on very big wine producers as they are Mastro Bernardino in Italy, Simington in Portugal and Torres in Spain, ensuring a real orientation towards the business exploitation. PricewaterhouseCoopers leading the commercial activities uh, for a successful market penetration also. Um, next, thank you. Then what is VTGO's concept? Uh, it is an ecosystem of services to optimize sustainable wine management with decision support systems on phenology, irrigation, disease, and business operation. It provides support to the wine growers in the management process by means of different technologies such as satellite imagery, drones, in-field cameras and sensors, and all of them integrated in a set of intelligent services. Next, please. Um, at the end, what BTGOS wants is to support smart agriculture to achieve three main outcomes, increase productivity, enhance resilience and reduce emissions. The platform combines observation data and services very relevant for the wine industry, and in particular, optimizing decision maker for, betting, uh, uh, for better control and monitoring, allowing wine producers make informed decisions, for example, on the seasonal and subseasonal temporal scales, helping to be prepared for extreme climate conditions that can damage the crops. Also, recommendations for improving the use of resources and efficiency to schedule the management tasks according to the available resources in a way that minimizing its cost and in terms of time, economic or environmental costs, which this can be prioritized by the farmer. Also, providing real-time information in a single platform, combining multiple data sources, satellite images, in-field weather stations, and weather forecasts for ensuring better accuracy of the predictions and helping to implement specific measures by knowing in advance, for example, the date of each of the phenological phases. And finally, also providing predictions to anticipate and face uh, main risks due to climate change all we know that climate change is a serious threat to agriculture because it's reducing crop yields, lowering productivity, and increasing the risks of drought, diseases, and extreme weather events. And also we've seen that, unfortunately, these impacts are expected to worsen as the global temperature rises and the weather patterns become more and more irregular. Thank you very much, Federico, um, the Thank audience. You. Thank you, Rosa, uh, for the big picture around VTGEOS. Um, now let's continue um, with the, the description of some of the services in VTGEOS that use Earth Observation. So uh, for VTGEOS, we developed different uh, intelligence services, but some of them um, 
are specific using uh, earth observation data. Uh, basically, we use earth observation for um, identify uh, management zone, um, detect anomalies, uh, um, highlight uh, stressed area, uh, but also to monitor uh, the phenology, for example, and perform some uh, area inspection. Now we'll dive into, into the first service that is uh, um, crop status indicators um, that uh, exploit the, all the um, Copernicus uh, uh, constellation to provide information about uh, uh, NDVI and leaf area index, obviously, but also evapotranspiration, biomass production, uh, nitrogen content that are all uh, indicators uh, um, that outline, uh, highlight the, the status of the vineyard. So it's important for wine growers to continuously monitoring uh, these, uh, these parameters of the vineyard. And it's not always possible for wine growers that have uh, um, many, many uh, hectares of vineyard to, to understand all at once uh, the, the status of the of their properties. So this crop status indicator uh, aims uh, for uh, for uh, for this um, for this scope. The second um, the second uh, intelligence service uh, that I want to to show you is the phenological monitoring. Um, for uh, those that are not expert in in phenological. Monitoring uh, phenology is basically track the crucial stage of the of the um, uh, grape wine uh, during the the season, the vegetative season. So it uh, out uh, it um, track the all the stages from bud break to to berry maturity to the ripening. Uh, this is very important for the wine growers. Uh, because at every stage, uh, the wine growers need to take a different action, and they um, they they need uh, to to know the status, the phenological status of the of the um, vineyard at any stage, at any time. Um, so I will show you how we use Sentinel Three to to monitor this uh, uh, this type of information. Uh, this uh, um, this module that we developed uh, include uh, several data sources. Uh, we, we develop uh, a module that is called Pheno AI because it uses uh, different models, different artificial intelligence model uh, to uh, monitor and forecast uh, the phenology. Um, the different models. Uh, uh, is because we use different data sources. Um, so we develop uh, models that use, for example, uh, Sentinel-3 or uh, weather station data to monitor or camera images to monitor the phenology. And we use climate weather uh, and climate prediction to uh, forecast uh, the phenology. Um, why we have so many uh, models uh, to, to monitor and forecast phenology. Uh, this is because of sustainability of, this, uh, of these services. We thought about uh, having different models that use different data sources to, have a, um, to ensure a scalable service. Uh, so because we know that uh, not, every, not in every vineyard we have weather station, uh, infield weather station. Okay, so if we cannot uh, have weather station, we can achieve the phenological monitoring through Sentinel-3, for example. Um, and now uh, we will see the, the Sentinel-3 approach. Basically, uh, Sentinel-3 offer three bands, uh, seven, eight, and nine, uh, with two measurements per day about the land surface temperature. So we can measure the temperature of the land uh, twice a day, uh, with a spatial resolution of one kilometer square. Although the spatial resolution is very coarse, uh, we believe that um, the, these measurements can, um, out, uh, can, uh, are enough to outline the behavior 
of the um, of the temperature of the land in the in the vineyard. So in this chart uh, is shown the um, weather station, uh, the, te the temperature measured with the weather station in orange and the uh, temperature measured by Sentinel-3 uh, in, in blue. As we can see, the, the behavior uh, is, uh, is similar. So we can uh, approx we can, um, we believe that we can approximate uh, the um, weather station temperature with Sentinel-3. And here, uh, our approach, we used, um, we process the time series of the land surface temperature. Um, with in addition, some basic information about the vineyard. And we process the, this information uh, with a recurrent neural network to outline the, um, the behavior of phenology through the year. Um, as a result, uh, we got um, we got a pretty good result, uh, especially in comparison with the baseline that we use with, that we considered that is uh, growing greedy degree days. That is a standard way, traditional way to um, to monitor uh, phenology. So with this uh, with this technology, uh, we can achieve uh, more or less. Uh, uh, seven eight days uh, of error um, in uh, in phenology monitoring and now uh, this is, was the um, the the uh, phenology monitoring service and now uh, Tommaso we will present you the the drone analysis service Uh, thank you, Federico. Um, within the VTGOS project, we also introduced uh, a remote sensing uh, vineyard monitoring uh, service, uh, which leverages uh, uh, drone acquisitions. Uh, the main advantage of using uh, drones uh, for applications of uh, smart agriculture and viticulture in particular uh, is the higher resolution that drone uh, cameras have with, in comparison to, for example, other, other data sources, uh, for example, satellites. Uh, this higher resolution uh, enables uh, new tasks to be performed. And for example, in our case, the, the task was to uh, was a semantic segmentation of vineyard rows uh, in, uh, in vineyard imagery. Um, and this was done uh, using a, a deep learning model. And the downstream uh, application of uh, this is uh, the computation of uh, two new uh, vegetation indexes which are the vineyard density index, uh, which we introduced, and uh, the visible NDY, which is basically a proxy measure uh, for the NDY, which is uh, originally a multispectral index. Uh, the VNDY is based only on uh, uh, RGB uh, images. Uh, so we uh, basically we uh, acquired over the years of the project uh, several um, drone acquisitions of uh, vineyards uh, of the involved wine growers in the project. With this data, we uh, developed a, um, a semantic segmentation model uh, that could uh, um, uh, perform the uh, the segmentation of the single vineyard rows in the vineyard. And uh, as I was saying, uh, we could compute, we were able to compute these indexes. Uh, the, um, the critical point is that, for example, the VNDY analysis that we have performed could be performed uh, separately uh, on the rows of the vineyard and the inter-row area. And this is not possible uh, when using satellite data and, for example, the NDY index, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is computed uh, based on Sentinel-2 acquisitions. For example, uh, here, uh, the rows of NDY and the inter-rows of NDY gather two different uh, information. Uh, 
for example, the VNDY computed on the rows uh, is uh, important and useful to to estimate and to assess the the general state of health of the of the single rows uh, and the general uh, vigor level of the rows, whereas the the VNDY computed the uh, in the inter-row area uh, is also useful because uh, uh, we can, uh, at the first glance, uh, see if there is any uh, ground cover vegetation. And ground cover vegetation, such as grass, grass and uh, bushes, is uh, often unwanted by wine growers because uh, it actively competes with the, uh, the, the search for nutrients in the ground. Uh, the other index uh, is the vineyard density index, uh, which uh, basically estimates uh, uh, not only the number of rows uh, in a certain area of the vineyard, but also the, the thickness uh, of the rows. And this is another measure which is useful to uh, assess the general state of health of, uh, of the vineyard. Uh. So uh, this uh, concludes our presentation on the delivered projects uh, of the delivered uh, services uh, within the VTGOS project. Uh, we will be happy to receive questions if you have any. If not, uh, we can go on with the presentation. Okay, so uh, our commitment to the VTGOS project uh, yielded not only useful services for the wine growers, but uh, has also delivered to us useful in insights uh, and the lessons learned in the domain of earth observation applied uh, to smart agriculture and viticulture in particular. Uh, a first lessons le uh, first lesson learned is that uh, uh, remote sensing and uh, satellite data in particular can be the best option to monitor a vineyard, but only in some particular cases. Uh, proximal sensing techniques like uh, in-field uh, sensors uh, have the advantage of being uh, accurate in their me measurements and can also take uh, frequent measurements. Uh, and this leads obviously to uh, very accurate models. For example, the, the phenological model that uh, Federico, Federico told, talked about. Uh, but uh, one of the cons is that uh, in-field sensors are, um, can be very expensive because they must be scattered all around the vineyard to acquire meaningful uh, data. And uh, they are often uh, uh, prone to failure and uh, require frequent maintenance. On the other hand, satellite data is uh, easy, easily scalable because uh, one single acquisition of a satellite can cover uh, not only the vineyard, not only a single vineyard, but uh, most of the times uh, the whole estate of the, of the, vine, the, the wine grower. And uh, most of all, they are freely available, uh, at least in the case of uh, Sentinel satellites. Uh, obviously, the con is that um, uh, it has lower revisit times, so uh, we cannot have uh, hourly measurements like uh, we did uh, with the in-field sensors. And uh, it has a, um, a lower resolution. Uh, and this leads to less accurate models, for example, uh, in the case of uh, the phenological model. Um, nonetheless, we argue that uh, uh, satellite, uh, satellites are the best tool to monitor uh, vineyards, which are very large in extension. Uh, they may be maybe the, the, the only tool to, to do this kind of uh, analysis and monitoring, uh, whereas uh, in-field sensors could, could be used uh, also in uh, small to medium-sized vineyards because uh, it will be feasible to do so in that case. Um, we saw that uh, satellites uh, are good to, to monitor uh, a vineyard and to estimate uh, some biophysical quantities, some crop indicators. And uh, for example, let, let's take this case study here. 
Uh, this is a graph which shows uh, the evolution uh, over the year of the NDY index uh, as computed by the Sentinel-2 satellite. And we can see that the, the progression of the NDY index uh, is uh, basically um, logical because um, uh, we see that uh, this evolution has a minimum uh, in the winter and when when the the grapevines are basically dormant there are no leaves and uh, there is a peak there is a maximum uh, in uh, late summer maybe early fall when uh, the the vineyard is ready for harvesting and this is a uh, something that we expect uh, in general uh, this is the same graph, but uh, for another vineyard uh, involved in, uh, in this study, in, in this project. And here we see a counterintuitive uh, behavior of the NDY index. Uh, we see that the maximum, the peak, is uh, in the winter, whereas there is a, um, uh, a minimum in the, in the summer. Uh, this is easily explained if we see uh, if we take a look at uh, some in-field uh, acquisitions by a camera. Uh, in that particular vineyard, we can see that uh, in the winter there was there was a lot of grass and uh, basically no leaves. So the, the the grapevines were uh, uh, basically completely naked. Uh, but the the satellite is is correctly looking to uh, um, uh, a fully vegetated field, uh, basically because there is grass all over the ground. Uh, and so uh, it returns a high level of uh, the NDY. As the year progresses, uh, the, the grass disappears and uh, the, uh, the, um, the leaves start to appear on the, on the plants. And obviously the peak is in July and August. Uh, but the NDY is still lower than in January, and that's because the the the, the vines uh, uh, are not closed in canopy, and, uh, and this means that uh, a satellite will see that there are uh, holes between the, the rows. There are uh, interrow areas which are basically uh, naked soil. It's bare soil. So the NDY index will be uh, not very low, uh, obviously, but still lower than uh, in the winter. And uh, this is because of the low resolution of satellite data. And uh, as we explained, uh, in this, uh, let's say, pathological case in which uh, there is grass uh, even in the winter, uh, it may be useful to support satellite data with the other kinds of data sources, especially uh, the one we talked about, uh, uh, drone acquisitions, uh, because of their higher resolution. For example, uh, a typical drone will fly over a vineyard and acquire uh, images which are uh, 1 to 10 centimeters per pixel in uh, resolution. And uh, this enables us to uh, to perform an analysis which is uh, uh, more fine grained, uh, also in relation to the NDY index. And now I will leave the floor ag again to Federico for the last lessons le lesson learned. Thank you, Tommy. So the the last uh, key takeaway uh, of Vitigeos is something that maybe uh, we cover a little bit in the previous session. That is, um, sometimes from, from satellite, we have lots of data, uh, but we are data scientists, so we can uh, understand this data. Uh, the problem is that um, for the wine growers, not, all, not, mm, not always, uh, the wine growers are interested in uh, seeing every number uh, behind uh, the, the satellite data. So our takeaway here is to uh, simplify uh, as much as possible the data visualization for, uh, for wine growers and maybe offer different level of detail uh, for the wine growers. So uh, the, it's important that they, they have a, at a first glance a, a picture 
of the of the vineyard seeing which data uh, which areas um, is suffering which area uh, is growing well and uh, if um, he or she wants uh, he can go in detail and see uh, and see other uh, other numbers other uh, other information um, so for example this is an example of uh, how we visualize in the platform the data um, this is the evapotranspiration index but instead of uh, seeing uh, the the numbers of the evapotranspiration, we see just uh, how is going uh, the evapotranspiration in the vineyard, uh, below in, in average, below average, or above average. So this is a uh, kind of information that uh, uh, can 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 give a big picture, an immediate uh, picture of the vineyard. So these are the three lessons learned um, of, of VTGEOS. Um, do you have any any question, any uh, curiosity about this? Oh, yes. Thanks. Uh, my question is, what was the response from the industry partners to the data you provided? Because I mean, from the data scientist point of view is great, but I was wondering, you know, how actionable it is for them from in their daily activities. Uh, which service? Uh... So the, I mean, you're providing a range of services and you describe those ones in terms of the, I think mostly uh, health or the growth period. Could that information be used by the, you know, the wine vineyards themselves? Or did they provide any feedback to you in terms of, you know, uh, what was the, yeah. To today activity potential yeah exactly uh well it depends um on the service but uh, for example uh, i can talk about uh, phenology phenology monitoring is something that uh, uh, wine growers uh, still today uh, perform uh, manual observation to to get information uh, uh, from the binage this is extremely important but uh, in case of uh, um, extremely large uh, uh, company that have maybe a uh, vineyard uh, also with uh, slopes, it's not always possible to, to go around the vineyard, the vineyard and see uh, the actual status of phenology. And this is why we uh, implement the, the, the phenology monitoring. Um, for the, um, I must say that uh, today, uh, the, the, the model is just a, um, uh, and uh, it's just um, an advice. Uh, it's just uh, it, it gives uh, an idea of the phenology phenology state. Uh, but we have another part of the service that is uh, phenological forecast, for example. Uh, this is extremely important and is uh, used by wine growers, for example, to. Um, uh, for example, the, the first phenological stage is the bad break. At the beginning of the bad break, uh, wine growers need to start the insurance. So they really need to, to know at which day the insurance uh, uh, is a little bit expensive. So they, they really want to, to know the exact date uh, at which start the, um, the, the insurance or uh, at, at which day uh, they need to be prepared for the reapening, for the yeah, for the reapening. So it's um a, for the phenology. Uh, it's very important to 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 collect this information to to give this information to the wine growers. Um, for the for the drone service, uh, um, it's uh, it could be used. Uh, we don't have uh, actually we don't have uh, any direct experience because it's the first year today, uh, this uh, vegetative season is the first season in which we provide the outcome of the drone service. So it's uh, under um, uh, experiment, let's say, but it gives uh, a specific idea to the wine growers uh, to, to precise information about uh, which area uh, is suffering and, uh, and the reason, because sometimes uh, uh, from satellites, it seems uh, that all go, go is going well, but 
if you if you see the drone images you see for example that uh, there's just grass in that part of uh, of vineyard Thank you. This links in well. I've got some drone questions for you. Um, have you ever thought of adding a thermal camera to your current uh, sensors? Can you can you repeat? Have you thought about thermal imaging because you've got RGB at the moment? Uh, which sensor? Sorry, I cannot. A drone. <laughs> Chemical. To your drones. Ah, uh, thermal. To okay. your drones. Uh, for which serves, I mean, uh, the um, Sentinel-3 offer term, terms uh, uh, do you mean for uh, for drone service? Yes. Ah, okay. So attaching a thermal camera to your drone, okay, okay. or actually expanding what you so okay. which if drone you wanna... do you use for capturing this, and what yeah, yeah. Um, software do you use to process it? Do you export it from the drone software, or do you put it into your own? Okay, let me move on. Um. Uh, the main reason we didn't use the, the thermal cameras uh, is that the wine growers that we that were involved uh, in this project uh, did only use uh, uh, RGB cameras, uh, at least uh, two of them, uh, because one of them uses, uh, uh, uses a drone with the RGB camera and uh, a, a thermal camera. Um, but we wanted to we wanted to create a service which uh, which which could work for everybody, uh, even with a, a cheap, uh, let's say a cheap RGB uh, camera installed on a drone. And so we did not uh, experiment uh, very much with the, the the thermal data that we gathered from uh, this one of the three wine growers. It is basically for us. It's um, future work. Basically, uh, the the main advantage of using only RGB cameras and so of using only uh, uh, vegetation indexes which are based only on RGB data is, um, as I said, uh, because uh, as I said, uh, is that uh, uh, RGB drones are cheaper and they are easier to to. Uh, for wine growers to to buy and and to use, and uh, also because uh, there are um, already works uh, exploiting uh, thermal plus RGB data, and we wanted uh, uh, to to create something, some service which only exploited the RGB data, and because uh, that was um, a new frontier in uh, uh, for this kind of application for semantic segmentation of vineyard rows. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, some curiosity question. I have uh, one uh, regarding, so you mentioned you were a data scientist and you mentioned some uh, type of data, including in situ measurement. Uh, I would be interested in maybe later knowing about what type of uh, sensor do you get and what type of uh, measurement did you collect just for for the sake of uh, my understanding, and you mentioned as well drone. Uh, to that respect, regarding the fact that you aligned with uh, GEOS and GEO and as well funded by the European Commission, did you conduct any uh, concrete activity regarding data sharing? And how basically did you collect those data, and especially in to measurement and drones? So we know about EO data, which are already collected and cataloged. But regarding this topic, did you conduct any practical data sharing exercise just to basically be uh, in position to, to share the data to the community at a larger extent. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and data sharing is one of the um, uh, main topic of the previous discussion. And it's uh, it could be very useful at this stage uh, to have a, a big uh, data hub for, uh, for agricultural data. Uh, the fact is, um, in VTG, wine growers not always uh, um, share easily their data. So we have um, the data from uh, from three pilot cases around the Europe, but uh, um, in some cases they uh, explicit, explicitly um, ask us to not to share 
uh, the data about phenology, for example. They mm, don't want to, to share the, the phenology dates because it's a... Uh, um, they, they want to, to keep them uh, a secret, private, let's say. Um, in other cases, uh, we can share the, the data. Uh, it's not, uh, actually, it's, it's not uh, on Earth observation, but for example, uh, we, um, we had a model that used in-field uh, cameras. In that case, they agree to, to share the data set, so we will... Uh, uh, publish a paper with uh, um, with two years of uh, in-field camera images uh, um, attached to the to the paper. That's uh, uh, quite new in the in the scene because we we didn't find any any data set uh, uh, of this kind uh, in in the web. Um, for the drone, I don't remember if we asked the, the, the permission to, to publish the data set, but maybe uh, it could be a possibility. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not sure they will uh, agree on this. <laughs> yeah, just a quick follow-up. Just data sharing and data management principle as a whole is wider than only having the, let's say, the... Um the right to share data there's good practices and coding sharing uh, even among your community so yeah just... yeah no, no no i i totally agree with you and i always uh uh, uh look for uh for uh data um data shared in in this uh here the the topic is uh, not always the um the property of this data is not our it's not our property but it's uh uh, wine growers' property, so they they must be they, they must agree on on the on the sharing. We and we are struggling to convince them to to share some of the data, and this is an actual problem. <laughs> uh, thank you. Just a question about the the drone data. Um... So you show it like, you know, it seems to be way more useful. I'm just curious about the cost of acquisition per square kilometer. What was your estimate? And then also how much time it takes to get it into analysis ready shape, the drone images. Okay. Um, I don't have the, the detailed data about the acquisition because we take the images, uh, we, the, the wine growers, uh, uh, have chosen uh, an external company to acquire data from drones uh, as a service. Um, I would say that we, uh, I, I don't have any detail about the, the kilometer square that we can cover, uh, but uh, uh, connecting to the previous question about the thermal cameras, uh, the problem is that we, uh, before starting these services, we um, we run um, research on the market. We have seen that there's lots of university and research center and private company that run uh, um, super complex drone uh, with uh, thousands of sensor uh, that give you s precise information about everything, uh, but they were extremely, I, I would say, out of the market because uh, for uh, wine growers want to to see the um, the vineyard from uh, an aerial inspection, we that and it's focused obviously on the money and uh, he I, I was just looking show, for some uh, uh, yeah you know, I, I don't approximate have, number, but, but the, you know you pay the say company more or less. It's yeah. uh, the budget was. Uh, uh, three or, or 5,000 uh, euro per each vegetative season to, to run uh, six flights uh, during the, the season. Hmm. So this is more or less the, the information. Yeah, so how many hectares with the... Yeah, I, I need to, to check it. Uh, it depends on the, on the company because uh, we, we run the acquisition in three different uh, European countries. And every country has its its own uh, its own uh, uh, coast. Okay, thank you.
it was with uh, with drone uh, with um, propel uh, propellers. Yeah. Yeah, but but I guess it's uh, at, the, at at this point uh, the the resolution uh, would be less, isn't it? Because uh, with these images we can reach the resolution of ten centimeters per pixel. Yeah, but you ah. can do that even. Sorry, even I was flying vineyards with a drone, um, two thousand fourteen to sixteen, uh, using fixed wing, and you can cover quite a lot of area only flying at maybe 120 meters maximum um, because of the CAA regulations, and you'll have a centimeter precision. You can download this information and put it through the software of the drone to actually produce potential NDVI. So this is why I was asking if they do it through the software provided by the drone company or they actually export it and you can put it into ArcGIS and, or Esri, however you want, um, and, and deal with it like that. So. There's lots of different ways to, to get here, but it's very important for your drone imagery to understand the platform that it's taken off and the parameters, because that will impact um, potentially some of the information you pass to the farmer. Yeah, that's yep. interesting. Maybe we can talk uh, later <laughs> about this. I'm interested in right. what you're saying. Okay, uh, let's go. Let's go ahead. I can show you the the VTGeos platform. Here it's a recorded video of just on that focus on uh, the ser the services that we present you today. Uh, also, this is the link to the platform. Obviously, you you need a, a some valid credential, but if you want. Uh, test the platform, uh, just uh, get in touch with us. At, uh, at the end of the presentation, you will find the, the contacts. Okay, so uh, the platform um, requires a login. Uh, every user has uh, a login that allows to, to see its own, uh, um, its own vineyard. And here is how the, the platform looks like. Uh, you can have access to all the intelligence services uh, that we developed uh, in, in VTGeos. And then selecting one particular field, you can uh, uh, see the details of the field. And, and uh, you have... Um, immediately information about uh, uh, the status of the vineyard. Uh, for example, as I explained before, the third lesson learner is to give a, at, uh, at a first sight uh, um, an idea about the status of the, of the vineyard. Uh, in this case, you have uh, different, uh, different indexes uh, and selecting the indexes, uh, the change, uh, the, the, the color changes uh, based on the status according that particular index. And of course, there's a second level of details where you can see along uh, through all the year, all the uh, information, in this case, uh, qualitative information about a particular index. Uh, so you can, um, you can see the how the index goes uh, through the year. Uh, you also can uh, a detailed view uh, about the index uh, and maybe also uh, compare the same vineyard at two different time um, to, to see uh, which are the different if some areas grow grows as expected uh, um, and and the other that uh, the other areas that grows less. And um, so this is for the some qualitative information. And uh, here you can see also the evapotranspiration, for example. Uh, you have access basically to all the indexes 
uh, that we provide. And then these uh, are kind of uh, qualitative information. And then you can have, have access to the quantitative information that is the third level of details. Um, and you can uh, uh, always export the, the data uh, in a in Excel format just to, to share and to use um, in other platform. Uh, the second uh, service is the phenology. Here in this case, the phenology uh, for that particular field um, present the outcome of all the models that we developed uh, for phenology. We have two models for the detection, uh, two models for the prediction. Uh, obviously, in a, um, in, a pro, um, in a production use case, uh, we will have maybe just two models, one for detection and one for prediction, based on uh, the data sources that is available. This is a research uh, for a research purpose. We, we put the outcome of all the models that we developed that use uh, different uh, uh, different um, uh, data sources and obviously uh, they have different uh, precision and it's always possible uh, regarding the the topic of uh, data collection is always possible for the wine growers to um, to input their achieved date of the phenology so that we we can have always a feedback um, and data for a reprocess uh, later on. Now um, let's uh, let's go to the to the last part of the of the session uh, that is um, to to discuss a little bit all together about some some uh, hot topic. But before I want to to see to know uh, who are you. Um, where are you come from uh, uh, and which are the um which are the roles that we have in this uh, in this room so maybe uh I don't know uh if we can uh, pass the microphone uh, uh, one by one but maybe because we already did in the, in the last session so maybe uh, i just ask you uh, how many of you are researcher uh okay so we have uh, lots of research. <laughs> okay. And how many are technology provider? Okay. Interesting. And for the, for the other, uh, what are your role? Uh, <laughs> can you, okay. Maybe can you present yourself? Um, I'm actually a lawyer, an Italian lawyer, but I specialize in the re regulation of uh, digital technologies. So I'm interested more in the legal aspects of, for example, data sharing or data governance. Um, and I'm currently a policy advisor at the Ministry of Agriculture in the Netherlands. So actually, I'm very, um, I was very interested about the aspect on agreements. And you said that farmers are not very willing uh, to, to share their data. So uh, this is uh, some of the aspects that I'm interested in too. And of course, all these developing uh, regulations at the European level on Data Act, Artificial Intelligence Act, and Data Governance Act to, to see how this impact uh, what it means in practice for companies and governments as well. So uh, yeah, this is a little yeah. bit my- uh, Cool, background. interesting. And <laughs> thank you. Hello, good afternoon. So yes, we are technical in the afternoon. Um, my name is Ilingu Dave. I'm the um, former head of technology transfer of the Italian Space Agency. I'm now working as a, a space economy advisor for uh, regional entities in, in Italy and abroad on uh, policy, but also on activities to match space and non-space. And the other hat is um, I'm a partner of a VC fund investing in space startups and spin-offs. Thank you. Okay, um, it's your turn. <laughs> so I leave the, 
the word to, to Tommaso to lead this session. Uh, so, uh, as Federico said, we want to stimulate uh, discussion with you and to engage you in uh, in discussing some hot topics uh, in uh, smart agriculture in general. And our first uh, question to you is uh, uh, if you have any experience in similar technologies uh, to the ones that we presented today. Um, maybe not, not only related to viticulture, but also to other cultivars. And uh, in general, if you uh, can think of other uh, kind of plants, other cultivars that can be, uh, that, to which we can scale successfully this kind of technologies. Yeah, I'm Marco Folegani from Mio. Uh, we are working on, uh, not similar, but uh, in the same domain, since uh, we are implementing uh, uh, some kind of services based on uh, uh, the analysis of climate indicators uh, related to the cultivation of, uh, for example, tomato or uh, agrums uh, in some part of, uh, of Italy. And uh, yeah, mm, from our perspective, we are working more on identification of uh, stressors, climate stressors, uh, in order to try to estimate a correlation with the productivity for uh, some kind of uh, crops. Uh, and uh, in our case, the scope is to identify suitable uh, area or uh, to try to predict with the support of climate scenario those areas that could be not uh, good in coming feature for some kind of, uh, of crop or that could be good for other that not uh, are currently cultivated. Thank you. And uh, some researcher, uh, we, we have lots of researcher here. So maybe you have uh, some experience uh, beyond vineyard uh, I bet. Uh, do you have any uh, on uh, on which other cultivars uh, uh, do you focus your uh, your research? Don't have any. <laughs> Just vineyard. <laughs> um. Oh. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a, a success story uh, by Elif company. Uh, they uh, successfully scaled uh, um, their services related to uh, the computation of crop indicators, uh, also to other cultivars such as uh, sugar canes, uh, table grapes, and apples. And uh, this lets us, us think that uh, there are some characteristics that uh, a cultivar should have in order to scale uh, the the vitigeo services and uh, these characteristics are for example uh, an extended uh, cultivated area because for example uh, it's better to use satellites when uh, there is a um, a field which is very uh, extended uh, because uh, it will be infeasible to use other, other techniques such as uh, sensors installed in the field or even uh, using drones. Uh, it is uh, cultivars which are more suited to these services are preferably uh, closed in canopy and this is a uh, uh, mostly in relation with satellite data, because as we explained before, uh, there is a, a serious problem when, uh, when the field uh, is covered in grass and uh, there is a ground cover vegetation. So uh, 
um, closed canopy uh, fields and uh, plantations uh, uh, solve this kind of problem. So maybe this kind of uh, plants, uh, this kind of crops uh, are more suited to uh, satellite analysis. Uh, another characteristic uh, could be that uh, we we want to monitor crops uh, which are highly susceptible to environmental conditions and for example to climate change because then uh, it is um uh, it is uh, important for the the field workers to to check whether there is uh, some stress in uh, in the plants or even some diseases uh, because there are uh, many crops which are more prone to this kind of problems and uh, one last characteristic could be that uh, um, we we can we can scale services to uh, crops which uh, require uh, some operations to be performed uh, during their growth uh, based on their phenological stage Yeah, don't know if you have any. Ah, oh, yeah. Sorry, it's more it's more general question, but I mean, if you look at wheat, for example, there's a lot of advanced wheat models already to you know forecast the growth and doing local locally um, projection on when the different stages are happening and what, how you manage it in the field. And I guess this is really prone to using you know. Um, smart agriculture and you know the maps in the tractors to really alter the stuff and i was wondering how much option or have you tried to look at existing models i know there's groups like it's called agmip that try to go synchronize all the different crop models across the world to improve the prediction and how this could link with you know really getting in-field data and projections to get to to farmers and how much you could adapt you know the ai you're using because you were mentioning how you predict the phenology is AI based? I don't know if you have also like mechanistic component behind it or how this the both uh, intertwine. Yeah, I think Federico will be more suited. To... Yeah, how is the the model that you mentioned? The <laughs> it's called AgMIP. It's a group that is found. They have crop models for wheat, for corn, for rice, and yeah. they try to bring them together to get something that increase the accuracy in of projection. And you have, you have different cultivars, different locations. And I think it could complement very well in having this in situ component as well and uh, bringing the satellite data, which I don't think they're doing. And yeah, we we haven't heard about it, uh, but yeah, we can uh, we can look. Thank you for for uh, for your input. Can uh, I, can I say something, Federico? Yeah, yeah Ernesto. Yeah, no, I mean that is quite interesting initiative indeed. And for example, what uh, will be interesting is to see the possible. The, uh, partnerships with that kind of approach where because from our from elif we have conceptual by conceptualized some of the models of course we cannot take into the whole a spectrum of 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 agricultural models but for sure it will be an opportunity to interact with that kind of research groups which have a quite more deep understanding of different commodities to see how Earth observations can add value to their current uh, set of, of, of variables that there have been already defined. What we have found out, because we did some work with, with some of those models, is uh, the characteristics is that it's a crop that is, stays short in the field in, when, when we look at summer wheat. And usually it's more prone, for example, when we look from satellite data to lodging. That is one of the components that was highlighted where to use that kind of this kind of techno technology. Uh, for the yield and yield forecast, uh, then uh, the component is to see how to reach to the first uh, take into account the dry matter content in order to get the the amount of kernel because when we measure is the whole canopy and then we try to infer what is going to be the amount that uh, indeed is, is the harvestal material in the corn, in, in, in the wheat is only the grain. So the challenge there is to get to the grain. 
and also to play with the moisture content of the grain. So those are quite two interesting challenges when we look at that kind of series of commodities. Yeah, thank you, Ernesto. You're welcome. Okay, I think I will give you the floor for... Uh, okay, the yeah, there's a, a last uh, question that we um, want to leave you that is... Uh, it is related to this, but uh, what is the future? What, what are the other, other use cases uh, uh, that we can implement in the future? Um, so... You, Marco already mentioned, for example, the land suitability uh, to analyze the um, the historical uh, um, historical condition of a of a soil to to understand which, uh, for example, which cultivar uh, fit the best uh, with that particular condition. Um, Someone from the discussion before uh, mentioned, for example, the uh, water uh, water management. So maybe uh, the not only the estimation of irrigation uh, required that uh, the crops required, but also uh, the the forecast based also on the weather forecast, for example. So that's mm, quite interesting inputs. Uh, of this session uh, about this uh, these other use cases, um, do you have any any other experience uh, in uh, in agricultural sector to uh, to other use cases? Nobody. Yeah, <laughs> I'd maybe have a general question on that future topic. Um, so we've heard that you have a platform set up now for viticulture, and I think you have to, I didn't understand exactly how you can access, but at least you need login and maybe be certified somehow to get there to login. Then we've heard um, that there are good models that tell you where to plant, which crop at which times, or if with climate change, we should move to potatoes or whatever. Um, but for me, always the biggest problem is to find all these different things and to know um, where they are available and how to access them. The same thing with these crop models. There, there's certainly a homepage that is there that shows all these different crop models, but they're kind of uh, inaccessible. And so I wanted to ask, what is your um, approach with the platform that you have? How open is it or how easily accessible is it? And how easily is the data that you have in the platform? How easily is it to be shared with, um, let's say, other platforms or other applications? Because I think in the end, that's the most important thing that we have to solve to get this information somehow together and make it accessible and interoperable. Yeah, interoperable is uh, it's the, the right word that we should focus. Uh, well, the, the platform is um, an ELIF platform. Uh, so it's uh, their uh, business product. So I don't know if Ernesto, you want to you wanna answer um, how is your experience in uh, interoperability and sharing information uh, uh, about uh, that is on, on your platform? Uh, thanks, Federico. Uh, first, we start from the baseline that uh, the data needs to be private. And that means that as, uh, if you are a user, you only have access to your farms. So that uh, also at the level of responsibility with the data management plan. Uh, on the other hand, it is option. There are options that you can share your fields with possible consultant groups. So for example, if you have some a person of an entity that gives you some kind of consultancy for your fields, you can grant access to that a particular set of fields. Uh, the process that uh, the, the landing part of the platform and how uh, the end user interacts with it is a process that uh, first we do a collaborative exercise where we go with him, train them how to use the data. On the other hand, when we look at the interoperability, 
we have developed a, a, an API service store which allows the interaction with different partners. And this is the case in Fitty Hills where we have different sources of data coming from different intelligence service providers in, and they are uh, collected into one system and the system is Fitty Hills. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, I agree that um, we should focus maybe more on, on the data availability and data sharing more than uh, uh more than other uh, other use cases maybe um because uh yeah it's it's difficult uh, as i said before it's difficult to to convince the 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 wine growers and other uh, um other uh, uh in the other agricultural sector that uh, data sharing is for is also for their goodness is also to, to develop something that one day they can uh, they can use and uh, it's uh, and also the interoperability between platform uh, should be sh should be agreed together uh, because i maybe i'm wrong but uh, correct me if i'm wrong uh, there's uh, not a um, solid standard about this uh, interoperability, inter, uh, inter, um, interoperability. I mean, there's standard for geospatial data in general that we can uh, we can apply to to the agricultural data, but maybe uh, there's some missing missing spot uh, for uh, for agricultural sector. May have yeah. maybe by design sync off. It's not the case. No worries. Still, uh, think good things to do. But you have whether it is processing, whether it is data encoding regarding in situ measurement. I'm not familiar with drone, but maybe the drone community has been put these yeah. things together. The, the so. problem is maybe there's too many standards. Uh, okay, you're in, you're in geo. At least I'm not advocating. I'm not from the OGC. There's no Marie Francoise over there. So, but OGC has plenty of. You may have basically find potential uh, support for your for your yeah, yeah. <laughs> hi federico um it's andrea online so i just wanted to say we have a question um i don't know if uh, jose you want to repeat your question or i can read out uh, what you wrote andrea can you can you wait just a minute we have a question here Okay, sure. I just want to link a few things together. We've got, uh, we spoke about agriculture this morning and um, something that's come out a bit with, with what you've been saying has been uh, the farmers are not really willing to release their data, but um, can you go into a little more depth of maybe why and which particular data sets they, they do and don't want to do? Because we have to deal with, um, the data spaces that are coming up in Europe and there's an agricultural data space. So understanding, I guess, why some of the data providers can't give data is, is useful for our overall goals and objectives. Thanks. Yeah, it's something that we can uh, discuss with the, with the wine growers. I can bring you the, the example of phenology because it's something that we... Um, we published about uh, and the problem uh, was that the wine growers don't want um, to to share the exact date of the of the phenology um, actually i don't know about but uh, I, I don't know why but i can guess uh, um, this is because they don't want to uh, to, to to allow other competitors to to know much about uh, the the process uh, in the the particular company so this is uh, i can i can guess it's uh, it's still a um a competitive uh, competitive reason uh, yeah maybe the lawyer have uh... <laughs> 
Well, no, actually, this is one of the topics that I would like as well to unpack because I understand that um, as well, there is this reluctancy because it's not known how this information can be used. And of course, some um, ways of using may be known, others not. And so new uh, ways that could come out and damage them may be thought about. So of course, they are trying to uh, make sure that uh, sharing the data then doesn't come against them. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, this of competition is indeed a topic that I've also heard a lot about. Um, others could be insurance companies might use this data uh, or in information about the uh, quality health of a field to maybe uh, increase uh, the uh, prices. And so this is also something that farmers are, are uh, afraid of. Um, and then in general, the idea of monitoring can be perceived in the wrong way as um, a tool to immediately find if something is not going as it is supposed to, to be, uh, then of course a lot of uh, techniques uh, um, are also, or let's say um, there are a lot of subsidies that are uh, given based on certain uh, preconditions and uh, uh, actually it could be valuable for governments, for instance, to know what's going on, to see if uh, subsidies, uh, the conditions are met or not. But from a farmer perspective, this is also quite scary. So um, I, I think, but this is my, my personal impression, that there is um, a lot to do in, uh, uh, we discussed also this morning, communicating um, the, the, the goals, the purposes for using the, the data. Um, but um, my question, uh, well, I have a few here. So first of all, um, is it if in this experiment uh, or this pilot that, that you have, um, you had the chance to compare um, the decision-making process of farmers without knowing all, all this very detailed and fantastic information uh, that you can provide them and what they would have done uh, indeed without this. So like to see um, if I use these technologies, I would make this decision. If I don't have this technology, I would make this other decision. Uh, do they look alike? Uh, uh, how better it is the decision I could uh, make uh, based on the technology? So this is something that I, I was wondering if you do, if you did any uh, kind of experiment. Um, and in my mind, this might be valuable uh, to show them uh, what they could gain from uh, using this kind of technologies. Um, and then another topic that is in my mind, and I understood it's also um, among the reasons that sometimes uh, make farmers very doubtful about whether to use or not these technologies, it's also um, the accuracy. So we discussed uh, also satellites have a, reach a certain level of accuracy and drones would be more accurate. Uh, then of course this has an impact also on the uh, quality of the data that uh, uh, you make available. And uh, uh, then uh, who would be responsible in case of mistakes uh, of uh, uh, the information that is produced. Uh, um, and so also this, I think it's a very important topic. I, I absolutely have no answer to this, but to my understanding, it is a, a topic of, uh, of concern uh, because then how much can we rely on, on this information and what happens if this information proves wrong? This is something that uh, in my mind needs to be tackled. Also. Yes, that's very good questions. <laughs> but again, it's not solutions. <laughs> but starting from, from the last question, um, something that uh, can be done is also is offer, uh, is also offer uh, um, some probability of this uh, uh, the uh, the the data that out outcome from from the models are correct, and in any case, the the platform is still a decision support system. So the the final decision we we provide uh, uh, information to support the decision that um, must be uh, taken always from the from the wine growers so at the end uh, is the wine growers that uh, can use can exploit this information uh, but with its own experience uh, 
uh, have to to take the decision for the for the vineyard. And uh, the other question um, was about okay the comparison maybe uh, between the result. Uh, uh, with or without uh, these technologies. That is uh, the scope, the objective for this third vegetative season in Vitigeos is to validate uh, our intelligence services to show the end user um, what are the differences between, I mean, uh, the, the goodness of our services and if they can, um, can be fine, can, uh, yeah, if, if they can find useful uh, using these services or not. Um, for example, this, the, there is um, a service in Vitigeos that is the disease forecast. And we have some uh, small areas in each vineyard uh, in which the, uh, the decision taken are based on the outcome of the disease forecast model uh, to see uh, which are the difference between uh, the yield at the end of the year we can see the the difference uh, between the yield of these uh, small areas um, with respect to the to the other uh, to the other areas in the in the vineyard so it's something that we we are working on it Thank you, that it's useful. Maybe a question for you. Is there any data that uh, you as a service pro provider would not like uh, to be displayed? So one thing is, okay, I um, I want to share the data about the plots uh, and how they are doing and the quality of the soil and the temperature. Um, but is there something that as a service provider, you would say, well, this would say too much about my business and I do not want to, to share it because, you know, this is my... Mm, it's confidential, it is a trade secret. Uh, so maybe, I don't know if it's just for you or maybe for the other technology pro providers that are here, because this is also helpful and very often is part of the discussion because it's not only about information about the soil, but also all the other actors that work on it. No, as uh, is my experience, we actually don't collect any, I mean, all the data that we, we collect are, uh, basically are based on uh, uh, Sentinel-3 that is uh, public available. So in this case, we, we don't have any additional data. Uh, and uh, the only things that we don't share is the final model, for example, for, uh, for phenology, uh, because it's, um, it's our property, but we uh, publish a paper describing all the process and all the pipelines so it's uh, easily replicable uh, with the same data yeah so if i may just provide you a testimony from another sector so i work in the renewable energy field so mostly on solar radiation and we are using in situ measurement coupled with um, let's say met data was a satellite or model for for decades and we, we came to this basically activity of trying to convince the community that operate and, and, and maintain weather, weather station, so big weather station, med station. But now you have plenty of uh, PV plants that are basically fully equipped with instrument measuring the, the solar radiation, the, the wind direction, the humidity, the temperature. And we try to engage with them to basically share your data. And we, we face this, uh, this issue. So it's a long journey. But you have to provide a concrete example of the benefit of sharing your data, meaning that if you want to size a plant in a given area and you only rely on a station which is 200 kilometers from basically the place you are spotted, it is basically useless. So it's basically very core information. So sharing the data into a network where you basically could be providing this to the community and the community and basically competitors as well may basically benefit and share as well data is something we've tried to basically work the concept. Uh, so we we have some, let's say, success, let's say. So we have been able to share a private company type of in-situ measurement that belong to their PV farm. So we have put little basically uh, advertising. So libinsitu.org is basically a full set of 
best practice to encode to share data using data management principle, data sharing principle, that as well as a, a, a network of over 300 stations, which basically we share for the community. So there you will find data which are open, data which are not, and we are struggling to make those providers open the data. So you have to provide, you have to guide, you have to educate. It's a very long story, but it finally works in, at least at some extent in some activities. So I don't know about agriculture, but basically we share the same ground of going to the data provider, make them basically aware about the, the benefit of sharing, and then you have to guide them into sharing. Sharing is not I share. So you have plenty of things, especially if you want to be in this EO, open data, open knowledge spirit. And there's, but there are uh, recipes, would I say. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm uh, Mark Nort, uh, member of the advisory board of uh, VTGOs. And we discussed all this in the advisory board meeting. Uh, so it went along the same lines. If you look at this particular situation, these are not small companies. These are quite big companies. The f individual fields, though, they may be small. So uh, what these companies aim to get out of this project is that they get better advice for, for pests and diseases so that they can prepare for that, uh, but also to prepare for climate change. Uh, so there is a kind of general interest because everyone has to do that. But at this point, what dominates, and understandably so, if I were a wine grower, I would do the same thing. I've invested in this, so the data is not for everyone. It is just for me to have my, my benefit. So, And as Lionel says, when you operate on a bigger scale, but then you would have something like Wine Growers United in Europe, then I think there's a mechanism to make this work and to share the, the data. But that would ask for an initiative, an initiative at quite another level. So at this point, it is just, well, straight the business, like how can I benefit most from what is invested in? So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's a long journey, but yeah, we, we should achieve this uh, uh, for the benefit of, of everyone. Um, ah, okay, Andrea, sorry, um, I almost forgot you. <laughs> Do you have a, a question from the online audience? Yes, we have a question, uh, whether using drone capabilities we can reach or not similar conclusions than those obtained at the pixel scale of S2 for getting more easily management recommendations with the latter given the current high temporal resolution still fully unexplored. In other words, drones can serve to train large scale model applications with S2 in the field of, for example, viticulture, one we know uh, the spectral behavior at the higher scale with drones? Or do we need uh, to move the satellite industry towards higher resolution sensors? Uh, well, uh, the satellite data, of course, is the, is the most scalable um, tool that we have uh, because it's... Uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, so, of course, if we can reach uh, a similar resolution, a similar drone resolution with satellites, of course, it would be uh, the the best solution for uh, for everyone. Uh, maybe even uh, a paid service for uh, for this kind of resolution from uh, from satellite, uh, because uh, as is my uh, our experience in Vitigeos, uh, the drone flights are very limited uh, by the weather. Uh, that is maybe is just uh, a sunny day, but uh, with a strong wind, um, and it's not always. It, it's um, something that uh, uh, people need to to go 
uh, on purpose on field to to collect data. So of course, uh, uh, having the the same resolution, a similar resolution from from satellite, uh, could be could be uh, the, the the best option. Um, and the the result that we have found from from drone uh, is is quite. Uh, I mean, uh, we show that it's quite different from, from the result uh, from uh, Sentinel-2 uh, because uh, it considered just the, the rows uh, instead of uh, the, the whole uh, areas, the, the whole land uh, with the crop. Um, yeah. um, I wanted to add that um, it's, I think we are far uh, to uh, achieving a submeter resolution uh, to optical satellites. So in uh, drones uh, 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 to this day have uh, a great advantage over satellites. The other advantage of, of using drones is that, uh, uh, for example, Sentinel-2 acquisitions uh, are basically useless on vineyards uh, when there are clouds. Uh, but our segmentation model of the rows works uh, even when it is uh, cloudy and because it is uh, very robust to um, different, uh, to, to visual heterogeneity in uh, vineyard imagery. So uh, this is another big advantage uh, of drones over satellite data. Yeah, we have. Uh... Yes. <laughs> um, just to probably add to that uh, debate that's going around, uh, the satellite image providers probably need to increase their resolution. And this is happening over time as we see the technology improve. So that will happen. There is sub-level satellite available, but it's military. It'll never be commercial um, in that regard. We have to understand potentially with satellite imagery and drones, there's not one that is better than the other, that it needs to be used together in a supportive way. And um, that's how they complement each other. So it's just a different uh, level of platform uh, remote sensing, let's just say, but one is not better than the other, but together they can actually provide you a very good solution. Yeah, we totally agree. Yeah, they are not uh, uh, an alternative. They they must be used uh, as a additional uh, data. Okay, um, I guess we can conclude. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for being here. Uh, it was a pleasure for uh, for us to to present you Vitigeos and hope to speak to you one to one during the lunch. Thank you.